All right. Um, how common was it uh, for you to be in a place where somebody might shoot at you when you were in the air? Real common. Um, our base, we had what was known as a one-eyed Charlie. Um, one-eyed Charlie was a person that the Viet Cong would press into service, give some dilapidated type of gun, give him a few rounds and tell him to shoot at the Americans. He didn't want to, but if he didn't, they'd come back at night and hurt him, hurt his family, hurt whatever. They would quite often then tell him that if he'd go down by the bridge, by the creek, out by his field, there's a little tin can sitting underneath the, underneath the, the bridge. There's two rounds in that can. He used to put his two empties in there. And he had to put his two empties in there and shoot his two rounds at us. And if you had a one-eyed Charlie, you didn't shoot back at him. Um, I mean, he didn't want to shoot at you. So he just gun over the barrack, over the berm, you know, bang, bang, and he'd be gone. And ours only hit one aircraft once, all the while I was there. But you knew he was going to shoot at you sometime or other. Mm -hmm. And he usually shot at us rather than other things. And so you didn't return fire. Um, one night, um, we got hit. I scrambled, got down, got the aircraft, took off. And helicopter doesn't really have to take off into the wind. We do for some safety procedures, but it's pretty well directing, making its own wind. It doesn't much matter. And I took off into the wind, down the runway. And as I got to the end of the runway, and I'm getting ready to go over the bunker line, and then the barbed wire starts, out on the uh, the rice paddies out there, all of a sudden there went this solid wall of tracers in front of me. And a helicopter is basically a flying disc. The fuselage underneath is just airstream going along for the ride. So I did a pedal turn, which means I just made the back end of the helicopter go to the front end. Now I'm basically going backwards. <laughs> and I turned and I just did a pedal turn and just went the other way down the runway. Um, you can't do that with a fixed wing. If I'd have been a fixed wing, I'd have been committed. Um, probably should have been anyway for different reasons. But anyway, I went the other way down the runway and then the OH-23 had tube radios. So I can't even tell anybody yet because you turn on tubes and you gotta wait for them to warm up. And I scrambled, so they ain't even working yet. So by the time I'm clearing the runway on the other side, I'm screaming back at the guys. Hey, tell everybody that gets an aircraft not to go off that end of the runway. And, but we got shot at, um, you know, it's not always in the same place. It's not always the same way. It's not always, I was covering a convoy one day and they got hit and I'm readjusting. Down the, down the highways quite often they, they would park um, tanks as part of the road security. Mm -hmm. And I was repositioning the tanks and directing their fire. I was also calling fire from one of our fire bases in. In the meantime, I went on guard frequency and requested any fast movers going back with ordnance. I, I guiding them in and having them drop ordnance along the top of the ridge line so that the Viet Cong couldn't escape over the top of the hill. Uh, while I'm doing all that, the captain that is liaison for me with the convoy calls me and tells me I got tracers going by my tail boom. Eh, all right. I mean, what are you going to do? We flew at a thousand feet above ground level, AGL, because at that place, ground fire wasn't effective from small arms mm -hmm. because you're outside of effective range. And you were real close that most anti-aircraft fire doesn't want to shoot you because you're real close. And if they fired at us and missed us the first time, we'd kick it out of, out of trim, drop all our pitch and be on the tree line before they could get a second burst at us. So we flew around at about a thousand feet above the ground, and uh, if it's missing me, that's good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, I can't go across the road because that's where I'm directing all the other fire. I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything about it. You just sit there and do your job. I mean, um, they used to say we were real cool. That we had, well, they <laughs> that, that, that we just had nerves of ice and. It, it, it's not true. Um, you got to fly the aircraft. If you don't fly the aircraft, it's going to crash. It will not maintain forward flight. It won't do anything on its own. You just got to do. So while we may look calm and we may look whatever, uh, eh, taint so. All right. Um, now, did the helicopters you fly, did they ever get hit? 
<laughs> I never got a bullet hole. Um, I did a tour and a half. Um, I did that for an early release from service, but uh, I never got a bullet hole. Um, two of them, I got so slow and low in doing the job that had to be done that they got so full of shrapnel they wouldn't even look at replacing it. They just gave me another aircraft and I found out later they stripped the components out of both of those airframes and scrapped the airframe. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they got hit. Um, I was once, when we got the OH-58s, we had the Bell tech rep living with us because they were so new. We had, thir we had 13 of the 20 of them that came to Vietnam in our unit. Mm -hmm. um, Self-centering bearings didn't. Self-lubricating bearings didn't. Of course, since they're self-lubricating, you don't put zert fittings on there, and you don't put the little nuts you can take off, put zert fitting in there. And so what are you going to do with them? Um, we had a lot of interesting times to start with them because while the, the Army had accepted them yet, that none of them had seen combat, none of them had been in those kind of environments, and we were working out stuff brand new. Um, forgot what I was going to tell you. Well, we were talking about uh, being hit and uh, damage or things like that. I mean, did you have accidents with those helicopters or close calls with them while you were learning how to fly them? I had two guys in my unit that cracked them up. Um, one was with an 086. Um, 086 had a unique character. Every aircraft has a little something about them that's different. Um, 086, if you hover downwind, um, downwind, upwind, I wasn't ever checked out in one. The tail rotor would disturb the air enough in that configuration that the tail rotor, the main rotor would disturb the tail rotor enough that it would lose integrity. And while he was going over the barbed wire, he thought he had a tail rotor failure. And in a tail rotor failure, you're supposed to chop the throttle and then dead stick it in. Well, he dead sticked it in the barbed wire, skids caught, he rolled it up. Um, he got medevaced out of country. Um, alive, doing fine, but um, we had another one who was going to impress people. Um, the aircraft set up with enough other connections that you can put headsets on and headphones and if you want to, you can give everybody in the aircraft set headphones, you can talk to them on intercom. And they were questioning about auto rotation, so he chopped the throttle and was bringing it in for an engine off landing. And when he got down, I guess around 500 feet, he rolled the throttle back on, except the engine had quit. But he went through the procedure, turned the throttle back on, but he obviously wasn't watching the instruments. And he went to pull pitch and his rotor blades slowed down even further. So now he's low and slow and no rotor RPM and he's committed um, it's a very forgiving aircraft. Um, he decided to try and make a running landing instead of trying to flare and found a rice paddy dike and took his skids off the bottom and that broke all the tubes that controlled the aircraft. From there on in he was going along for the ride instead of flying it. And I have pictures of that aircraft. It, the, the main body of the aircraft fuselage basically broken in half stayed together and landed down there, but it got bust up. He ended up with a, a spinal compression. Um, he, yeah, um, I was flying, I don't know what I was going to tell you. Our OH-58s were so new that nothing really worked the way it was supposed to. And when it didn't, pilots like to fly. I mean, we got into it for a reason. We don't like war, but we like, we like flying. So we'd go and fly with some of the uh, lift units, some of the Huey units. And um, I was flying with the Huey unit and we were going down the Idrang Valley and I was in flight lead, which means that if you have a V, I'm the head goose mm -hmm. in the V flying down there. And all of a sudden on the radio, there's all kinds of chatter. Chalk two's going, chalk three's breaking off, chalk four's going overhead, chalk five's going low. What's going on? We're getting raked with 50 caliber fire. The only aircraft didn't get hit. Mm -hmm. um, over the border one time went into an LZ, the only aircraft to come back out. Um, 
I don't know. I got a guardian angel with ulcers. Yeah, something. Owe him an apology someday. Okay. But um, you do the job. And, and while the aircraft got banged up and cracked up and shot up, um, the death rate, uh, the injury rate, the Army lost more pilots in one year. I mentioned we had three-year obligation. Mm -hmm. One year was Vietnam, one year was back to state training, then back to Vietnam. They lost more pilots in one year in the States due to motorcycles and cars, alcohol, motorcycles mm -hmm. and cars, than they did in two years of combat flying. So you talk about us being loose wired and mm -hmm. crazy, but I guess, I guess. Yeah. Well, you were maybe a, a little bit less so in, in the sense that you had religious motivations that made you maybe behave better than yes. some of your colleagues.